All right, so welcome back. There's good news in the last video. It's that I'm moving on to a new topic. I'm going to need to move through these topics perhaps quite a bit faster than I have been because I've got 80 of them to get through before a test I'm planning to take in, let's see here, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I've got five months. So I've probably got about 70 left, maybe 60. So 30 days in a month, you know, it's going to take me two months to get through them if I'm doing one topic a day. And so far, I'm definitely not moving at that rate. So, but I, I got five months. So that might be a, a good subject for a later video. It's just kind of do the math to see if I'm on track to actually making that date, if I can take it earlier, if I can take it later. Um, I, I do need to take it before the end of the year though, in order to um, have that be the most, uh, in order to have it count the most uh, towards progressing my career, I'm really gonna need to do it this year. So moving on. Now the next topic is gonna be BFD. So without even looking at it, I know from my earlier studies, BFD is uh, bi-directional forwarding detection. There it is. So it's a simple hello mechanism that detects failures in the network. Hello packets are sent at a specified regular interval. A neighbor failure is detected when the routing device stops receiving a reply after a specified interval. So in addition to those TCP syntax, SYN packets that are sent and the BGP keep alive, I think we're gonna see some new BFD packets set out, so we'll make sure to look for those in Wireshark. BFD works with a wide variety of network environments and topologies. Failure detection timers for BFD have shorter time limits than default failure detection mechanisms for BGP, so they provide faster detection. Okay, looks like an interesting note here. Configuring both BFD and Graceful Restart for BGP on the same device is counterproductive. Okay, and we did notice in all of the packets that we looked at earlier, there was Graceful Restart. So it looks like we're gonna have to find a way to turn Graceful Restart off. But continuing, when an interface goes down, BFD detects this instantly, stops traffic forwarding, and the BGP se session goes down, whereas Graceful Restart forwards traffic despite the interface failure. This behavior might cause network issues. Hence, we do not recommend configuring both BFD and Graceful Restart on the same device. So hopefully they will be giving directions on how to make sure that you have disabled Graceful Restart if you are enabling BFD, bidirectional forwarding detection. Oh, right. Here's some specific information about switches, not going to be relevant. From what I understand, it's just going to be the MX uh, devices on the exam. The BFD failure detection timers can be adjusted to be faster or slower. The lower the BFD failure detection timer value, the faster the failure detection and vice versa. That makes sense. For example, the timers can adapt to a higher value if the adjacency fails, that is, the timer detects values more slowly, or a neighbor can negotiate a higher value for a timer than the configured value. The timers adapt to a higher value when a BFD session flat occurs more than three times in the span of 15 seconds. Uh, 15,000 milliseconds. A back off algorithm increases the receive Rx interval by two if the local BFD instance is the reason for the session flat. The transmission Tx interval is increased by two if the remote BFD instance is the reason for the session flat. You can use the clear BFD adaptation command to return BFD interval timers to their configured values. The clear BFD adaptation command is hitless, meaning that the command does not affect traffic flow on the routing 
device. Okay, that's really good to know because we know, of course, there's clear commands that are not hitless. The clear BGP name resolve, that's certainly not going to be a hitless command because you're going to sever that BGP connection and then reform it. So it's really good to know which clear commands are hitless and which ones are not hitless because if they're hitless, you can do them in, in production and or, or in, in some situation where you don't want to affect the traffic flow. But if they are not hitless, then you absolutely cannot and you need to do them in a scheduled maintenance window. So that's a really good term to be aware of, hitless. Okay, so here's just some information specific to the OS type. So let's dive into the example here. This example shows how to configure internal BGP, IBGP sessions with the bidirectional forwarding detection BFD protocol to detect failures in the network. The minimum configuration to enable BFD on IGP, IBGP sessions is to include the BFD liveness detection minimum interval statement in the BGP configuration of all neighbors participating in the BFD section. Okay, well, how do you disable personal restart? I'm kind of curious if I'll go ahead and see if they mentioned that at all. Yeah, I don't see anything. So it might be something to, to look into or when we're looking at the Wireshark captures, just make sure that even if we see graceful restarting, there's some indication that it's actually turned off. So let's see here. The minimum interval statement specifies the minimum transmit and receive failures for intervals for failure detection. Specifically, this value represents the minimum interval after which the local routing device transmits hello packets, as well as the minimum interval that the routing device expects to receive a reply from a neighbor with which it has established a BFD session. You can configure a value from one to 255,000 milliseconds. Optionally, you can specify a minimum transmit and receive intervals. You can specify the minimum transmit and receive intervals. Similarly, using the transmit interval, minimum interval, and minimum receive interval statements. For information about these or other BFD configuration statements, see BFD liveness detect. So let's open that up in a new Tab just to kind of, kind of see. I really like this about Juniper Doc too, how they have a separate page for each command. That's that's really shows you the options. And it's, uh, it's just nice that it's there. So it looks like there's a note. BFD is an intensive protocol that consumes system resources. Specifying a minimum interval for BFD less than 100 milliseconds for routing engine based sessions and less than 10 milliseconds for distributed BFD sessions can cause undesired BFD flapping. So, I mean, that kind of makes sense because you would think, like, oh, well, why wouldn't you just have BFD running on, you know, every millisecond? It's like it's going to millisecond, millisecond, you know, whether that link is optimal. And if it goes down, in one millisecond, you're like, oh, God, well, why would you do that? Well, the answer is <laughs> because we got limited system resources and anything less than 100 milliseconds could affect the way BFD runs and cause it to falsely flap the link because it's, it's just requiring too many resource, system resources to work properly. So depending on your network environment, these additional recommendations might apply. To prevent BFD flapping during the general routing engine switchover event, specify a minimum interval of 5,000 milliseconds for routing engine-based sessions. This minimum value is required because during the general routing engine switchover event, processes such as RPD, MIBD, and SM, and SNMPD. Okay, so this looks like RP. So 
and these are all demons. So, so Mib, you know, that looks familiar. That's what, like SMP. And then of course we got SMP right here. So these look like they're, they're the D stands for daemon. This looks like um, RP. Uh, I'm kind of curious what that is. So Juniper, oops, Juniper RP. So static RP. Uh, there's, so it, it kind of jumped out at me because in the last exam, the IP, I had to learn about multicast and RP was a very common term, but it, it's for the uh, rendezvous, rendezvous point. So it's, um, yeah, 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 the rendezvous, rendezvous point. So it's definitely, I don't think what is being called out here is, is the multicast rendezvous point. I, I really, I'm not sure what this refers to. So hence, BFD processing and scheduling is effective because of this lack of CPU resources. For BFD sessions to remain up during the dual chassis cluster limb control scenario, and hopefully the audio hasn't been too bad lately, but just in case I'm going to actually put the microphone onto my face and hopefully it fixes it and it's better now. So for BFD sessions to remain up during the dual chassis cluster link control scenario, when the first control link fails, specify the minimum interval of 6,000 milliseconds to prevent the LACP from flapping on the secondary node for routing engine based sessions. So this, oh yeah, cluster, okay. Dual chassis cluster control link. So port channels, seems like they're talking about something like that. So these, these rests look like they're for very specific scenarios. Um, so probably not relevant to the exam, they're more relevant for a real world production scenario. This looks interesting for BFD sessions to remain up during a routing engine switchover event when nonstop active routing NSR is configured. Specify a minimum interval of 2,500 milliseconds for routing engine-based sessions for distributed BFD sessions with NSR configured. The minimum interval recommendations are unchanged and depend only on your network for deployment. So BFD is supported on the default routing instance, the main router, routing instances, and logical systems. So here's the config. So that's a review of BFD, what it is, what it stands for. It's just a way that you can recover, you can tell a link is down faster than you could just using what is given to you in BGP. So unfortunately, BGP does not have the capabilities to detect if a link is down quickly enough for it to be really useful. And in fact, they had to develop a whole new protocol um, BFD, bidirectional forwarding detection to detect that earlier and take actions based on that instead of based on what you can get from BGP alone. All right, so let's type in all the config. Config your private, oops. And let's, let's start on device A. And you can see I've set up the in between videos, I've set up the topology, but I haven't configured anything. So let's do that now. There's my public key. Don't look twice. Don't don't uh, rewind the video and get that. So let's see here. Edits logical systems. A. And then this is going to be zero, zero, zero. So if I do a run show int terse, put match g dash, yep, zero, zero, zero. So edit int, 
that zero. Oh, actually, it's going to be unit one. Oh, but here's here's we're going to see a an error. But I'll just follow along with exactly what it said, and then we'll get a good lesson into why uh, this is not going to commit. And if it does commit, that's even better news. That is my preferred thing. Oh, looks like I don't have pure unit as a command. So I don't see pure unit anywhere. Maybe it's because my Let's see here, or maybe it's, I'm not sure what a LT interface is. Let's, let's look up that. Juniper LT interface. So this is a logical tunnel interface. So, wonder if there's a way to I wonder if this is going to work so I guess I guess I'm just going to go with this we might have to dress it up but not have it be a logical system because really we're we're just here to learn about BFD, we're really not interested in, in learning about logical systems unless it's going to be a, a, a topic on the exam. And if that is the case, it will be called out in its own topic later. So it's really not something we're interested in learning about. So, and it looks like BFD is supported on the default routing instance, routing instances, and logical systems. So I don't know why they chose to, to introduced it to the reader in a logical system first, but um, it's not that it has to be done in a logical system. It's, it's just that this document chose to introduce it for the first time on a logical system instead of the default routing instance. So let's go ahead and just create a tunnel interface. So LT, one two zero is that possible it is okay so let's do this edit unit one set description to b set encapsulation ethernet set now okay now i've got peer units and now set family inet address Class A private address, the host address being one, the network being zero, broadcast being three. So now we're going to look at, we're going to go up and go up twice because I know that I have some lingering config. Yep, here from where I tried to do it on a physical interface and not a logical tunnel interface. Oops, and I got to do a displace that relative. Okay. Oh, looks like I've still got another one. There's an additional command. All right, so now there's another interface command that needs to go on there. So edit logical systems A, interfaces, sets LO0, unit one, family, INET address, class C, private address, 
Oops, and it's going to be dot five, not dot three. And if you're from Cisco land, you can actually have multiple IPs on a port. So I do need to go and actually delete that dot three, or else I'll have both dot three and dot five on there. So now I'm going to go into the protocols, configure the protocols. We're building an internal. And here's trace options. These are something that are interesting. It's kind of the Cisco version of or sorry, the Juniper version of Cisco's debug, but instead of just putting it out to the command line shell, it, it saves it into a file and then you go and you look at it later, or you can do a monitor start on that file and see it in real time that way. So here's the good old BFD liveness detection command that was mentioned up front. So this is how we're actually enabling BFD. These, yes, these commands say BFD as well, but this is a trace options command. So it's just for logging. This is to actually enable the feature. So let's go and do that now. And we're going with, it looks like the smallest recommended interval. These are in milliseconds. So you can go smaller than that, but if we remember up from our note here, the smallest, okay. So, so we're a magnitude of 10 higher than the, the smallest recommended interval, which is 100. And we went with a thousand, so we can, bump it all the way down to to 100 we've got plenty of room to work with if this is not satisfactory but hopefully that is fast enough so now i've got to configure neighbor six dot four so this is actually public address, class C public address. Oh, yeah, and then there's a, a private address as well. Two different neighbors on two different subnets, of course. All right, so let's enable the IGP. Oops, passive. So we want it to include the subnet that it contains, the interface that's configured on the interface. We want those to be advertised out into BGP, but we don't want BGP, sorry, sorry, OSPF, but we don't want OSPF, hello, uh, LSAs, any kinds of traffic to leave this interface. I mean, it's a loopback interface, it doesn't go anywhere, but even if it were a physical interface, if it were, for example, just facing a host or somewhere where, where it wasn't important for us to send BGP traffic to, but it was important for us to actually include that subnet as, as something our other routers need to go know about, that's what this keyword passive means. So it's gonna be do not run OSPF, but advertise it. That's a perfect description. Really, really useful to, it's kind of the best way, you, most, most um, shortest way you can really say what that feature means. So you don't run OSPF on it, you're not sending out any LSAs, any, L, any hellos, but you're advertising the route on that interface. All right, so the next one, this is not gonna be a passive. Oops, logical tunnel.
Yeah, I'm not sure if the logical tunnel is going to work, like if it'll know to just automatically use the port that's up or if I need to specify that. So, of course, I can always do another Google search for more information about that. All right, so I think device A will be done and I'm not expecting this commit to go through. One thing you can always do, which is another really nice feature about Junipers is if you don't know whether or not it's going to go through, but if it just so did happen to go through, you wouldn't have wanted that to go through. All you wanted to do is to check whether or not the config is valid. Just throw that command check after the end of the commit. And now it will just tell you if it will succeed or not. But if you do a sh run show configuration, um, wipe display set, you'll see you, you did not actually make that commit. So that's a really great command for the kind of what I talked about in earlier videos, having a sense of curiosity, you know, having more knowledge about what you're doing without um, causing issues, commit check is, is perfect for that because you can just do, you can just put in a command, you can do a commit check, and then you can do a rollback zero, and uh, you, you did nothing on the device. All you did is you went into, if it were a, a laptop PC, you know, you just opened up the file explorer and you, you took a look at kind of you know my computer you took a look at what it said about that what os is running what the specs are on the computer but you did not you know crack it open with a hammer and pull out the hard drive and throw it against the wall so it's a really great command to use to kind of learn more about about networking in general and, and getting more comfortable on the cli all right so Oh, and actually, I'm surprised it actually succeeded. I was not expecting that to happen, but um, yeah, so let's move on. And I think I'll try to get through all of these and then I'll save the step-by-step -step for the next video and definitely the verification. Um, but for now, I'll just get these two done and then uh, that'll be the end of the video for today. So I'm going to kind of move it. Oops. Yeah, so I'm really not sure what is going to happen with these logical tunnel interfaces. I mean, hopefully they'll just work, but that'll be interesting to see. Worst comes to worst, of course, I can just do it in the default instance and not in a logical system. Oops. And you, you might be asking, uh, if you haven't seen some of my earlier videos, why go through all this trouble to type it out? I mean, it's right there. It says even in the in in here, it says to quickly configure this example, copy the following commands, paste them into a text file. Like you're going to be doing that on the job. You're like, why are you going through all this trouble? Well, for me, I just you know I'm going to be taking a test. I'm going to be sitting down in a room where you know I'm, I'm stressed out and I don't know what's going on. I really want to get comfortable typing in these commands, having, having, you know, the feel of them in my fingers and really kind of understand what I'm doing at a more like tactile level like that. And I think I would recommend other people do that as well. You'll notice I don't even really use the, 
uh, tab button all that much unless it's something I'm absolutely 100% comfortable with and really sick of typing out because I know so well. But anything that, that's not 100% reflex, I will not tab it out and I will not just copy and paste it. But yep, on the job, of course, I'm gonna take full advantage of all the tools I have available. I'm even gonna write up Python scripts to, to make my life a lot easier, but just in the lab preparing for a test where I don't have any of those tools, of course, I'm going to make sure I'm as comfortable as I can be with the tools that I have. So family inet address 2.163.6.4. I mean, I'm going to be getting secure CRT, so I actually will have some Python scripting capability, but I really personally wouldn't feel comfortable doing that because I wouldn't know like where the files save and I wouldn't know like if I even have like the correct permissions. So just kind of typing them in the first time being, you know, really certain of what I need to do on the command line and, and kind of not taking shortcuts. I think that's really kind of the way to do it. Of course, my attitude might change if I come up closer to the exam and, oh no, I've only covered half the topics on the material. At that point, I might wanna just go ahead and copy paste things in. At least give myself like a abbreviated uh, lesson plan or something like that. So here's now this might actually be worth a down vote. Um, I mean, it's one of those things where, yes, I can figure it out. I know what they're talking about. It's not throwing me for a loop, but you can see here 192.168. Dot six dot five. Well, it says 192.163 and it's consistent across that. In fact, we can see here. Oh, actually, never mind. Okay, so yeah, it just is a different subnet, it looks like. So, yep, yeah, definitely not worth a, a downvote. So, yeah, and believe it or not, I actually do try to be pretty conservative in uh, the number of downvotes I submit. Any, anything that I, one, don't believe that I know how to fix, I really won't downvote. And then anything that I can kind of figure out that, that really hasn't cost me any time or, or made me do the deck Jackie Chan meme, I really won't submit a down vote for. All right, so hopefully this commits and we just got one more left. Perfect. Another kind of quick aside that you can do for commits. Configure privates is you can actually add a comment. So you can do commit comment and make it really nice and easy for your coworkers. So you can say, the reason I did this commit was because I was working on this example. So I can put the name of, of what I was working on 
actually in the commit so that when somebody goes and does a show system configuration list or run show system, uh, what is it? Let me see here. So show system commit list. When somebody says that, or, or just show system commit, now they'll get a custom message added after here that'll really make it a lot easier for, for your coworkers. So that's something I recommend if, if something you're doing isn't clear, or let's say that you're working an actual order at work and it has like a ticket number or something like that. You can put the ticket number in there, make it really nice and easy to, for people, other people to work with you. All right, so last router. All right, so here's the command of the hour. This is what we're learning, and this is what's gonna be on the exam. Just knowing more about those. One thing I haven't done, which I think I'll do right now, is take a look at the help menu for that. It's always good to have a sense of that. So we can see, and, and here we can even see, okay, so let's narrow it down to BFD. So for BFD, we've only got one option, BFD liveness detection, and this is bi-directional forwarding detection BFD options. So that's a pretty good help, help menu there. It tells you what BFD stands for. And then here's the stuff that's just gonna be included at every menu just to pull in an apply group. But you've got authentication options, detection time, hold down minimum receive, Minimum interval for transmit and receive. So lots of good options there. It's always a good idea to get used to what the question mark's gonna tell you. So we're gonna go with the minimum interval, which is the minimum transmit and receive interval in milliseconds. Yeah, the better you are with the question mark, the more you can, uh, you can kind of pick up on a new device, maybe one you've never even worked on before. If it's got some sort of help menu or question mark, you can really just dive into a brand new system that you've never even seen before. And as long as you know the concepts behind everything, you know you know what ARP is, you know the difference between an IGP and EG, EGP, you know. Um, you know, about like how to set up SSH, all that. You can figure it out just by using the help documentation.
All right, so hopefully this commits. Looks like it committed. So yeah, let's save the step-by-step. -step. It looks like the step-by-step -step is just the thing that we already did. So the next video is just gonna be going right to the right to the verification. And hopefully those will go nice and smooth without any issues. But if they don't, that's even better content because we'll go in troubleshoot it and get it to work. So good stuff to come. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy the next video.